Join the table and drink the cup. Lose the mistake we're all thinking of. I can tell, I can tell there's a window open somewhere. You can smell, you can smell the wind blow through and clear the air. If you wait, if you wait, you can almost taste the salty spear. No, you fell. While we turned away from him, he turned his heart toward us. While we chased after selfish desires, he chased after us. While we made excuses for our misguided choices, pursuing an elusive sense of fulfillment, he emptied himself to take the form of a servant. This unthinkable inequity our Creator clothed in flesh and weakness for the sake of those clothed in iniquity. 
While we were lost and alone, he became a path for us. While we embraced the comfort of falsehood, he embraced us and showed us truth. While we were eclipsed in shadow, our spirits broken and dying, he became life and light to all. Our shepherd, our teacher, our savior and king. And when it seemed the world had given up, he gave up everything. At just the right time, when we were powerless, he displayed his power and purpose. While we stood accused, he accepted the accusation. He endured humiliation and the untold suffering of crucifixion. For while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Not because we deserved it, far from it, but because there has never been a greater love than the love of Jesus. Today, if you feel hopeless, he gives hope unconditionally. If you've been rejected, he accepts you completely. If your burdens weigh heavy, lay your fears and failures at the foot of the cross, for his blood has erased them entirely. No longer a slave, but an heir of salvation, you are his child, his chosen. You are his beloved. Good morning. Will you stand and worship with us?
Amen. We are so excited to be worshiping with you guys today. And as we are approaching Easter, so excited to celebrate the God who lives and to sing about him and how good he is and how he does forever reign. So join us in this song. Nothing good in me. You are love, you are love, on display for all to see. You are light, you are light, when the darkness closes in. You are love, you are hope, you have covered all my sin.
the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide the ransom for my life oh he is my song you are good good oh you are good you're good the king of my heart be the wind inside my sail the anchor in the waves oh he is my soul let the king You're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. On Thursday night, the band, before we rehearse, I like to spend some time talking about Jesus. <laughs> it just seems appropriate. Um, and this week, we read from Isaiah 40. And uh, in verse 27, it starts, Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my right or my cause or the justice due to me is disregarded by my God? 
Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youths shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. The first line of that just really felt so true. When Israel says, why have you abandoned me? Where are you, God? The nation speaks out, my way is hidden from the Lord. I'm disregarded. And I don't know if it's just me <laughs> that sometimes feels that. But the idea of maybe feeling forgotten or weary felt true to us this week as we meditated on this scripture. And I'm excited for us to sing together this last song. It's called More Than Enough. And the second verse says, finally, my eyes can see you've never abandoned me. I'm held by the kindness of a father who won't give up. My father, you'll never give up. And we believe that. We choose that truth. And I want us to sing it together today and let it feel true to you. We'll sing it until it feels true to you. Because it is. God did not abandon Israel. He didn't abandon the disciples. And he's not abandoning us. And so let's sing to the God who does not give up.
we just stand here this morning, God, just thankful for just the truth about you. God, that we've been singing this morning, the truth about who you say we are. Uh, it's just, it's awesome to be able to just rest and be at peace in that reality. God, and I know it's easy to, to feel differently, God, as the, uh, you know, just the week goes on and we start believing the lies again. God, that your Holy Spirit would just fill us and remind us of your truth and we would live in and out of that truth, God, that you love us so much, that you're more than enough, that you are so good to us, God. I was just thinking of, uh, it made me think that third song, uh, you, are, you Are Good, You Are Good. <laughs> That's all I remember the song. Just, uh, <laughs> I, I don't know what it is about when I get up here. I, I, I remember stuff when I'm over there and then I forget when I'm here. Um, but Matthew, in, in the Sermon on the Mount, right? This passage uh, where Matthew in chapter 7 uh, reminds us of what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. But I think just, I was reminded of this morning, and then that song reminded me of it, and so I want to remind you guys of it. Uh, Jesus said this, said, ask and it will be given to you, seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you, for everyone who asks receives. Right? Everyone who asks, receives. The one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, you will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? And I was just reminded, like, you know, God is just so good. And it's so easy to get wrapped up in, you know, this life where, you know, we're in a broken world and we're broken people. And it's just, it's, it's hard, right, to remember sometimes just how good God is. Because we're just focused. It's not that the good things aren't right there in front of us. It's just that we get focused on things that don't feel good. But the reality is God works out everything for good of those who love him and are called according to his purposes. So we can even believe and trust and thank God for the things that don't feel good. So it's just, it's amazing. And then that last part of that verse is something that we can tend to forget. We can, we can bask in his goodness and still miss the mark. Because it says right after that, so in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. And as we know, like, Jesus loved us so much, calls us to love one another, not just the way we would want them to love us, yes, but even the way Jesus loved us, we're called to love one another. So, like, let's bask in that goodness, remember that, and then take that goodness and do good to one another. And that's just, that's what this life is all about. So, God, we thank you so much for just the reminder of how good you are, how great you are. Um, God, you're, you're more than enough. That's Enough would be great, but you're more than enough, God. And we thank you for just the truth of who you are today, that we don't have to stand here in fear about what's coming up, God. But we can be at peace because we're at peace with you now and forever, and we thank you for that. We thank you for this opportunity to worship you with our mouths, with our instruments, with our gifts and um, our voices. God, uh, you've called us to do that. We're designed to do that. We're right where we need to be as we do that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Awesome. Go ahead and have a seat. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to uh, dismiss our big kids. So that's kindergarten through fifth grade. You guys can make your way to the hallway. You got, oh, you got Team Sproul. You can't get any better than that, except for the other teachers that do it the other three weeks, maybe. They, they, I don't know. Um, awesome. So K through fifth, if that's you, head to the hallway. You guys have your class. Excited for you guys this morning. Um, all right. Today, I'm just thankful for our, you know, this this team up here. Again, sometimes we forget 
the amount of time that goes into this team leading us in this time of worship. I'm just, I'm, I see it, okay, and some of us just, you know, don't. So I just thank you guys for all, so many people that make Meetup happen every week. We so appreciate you guys, the gifts God has given you, and your willingness to serve us with that. So, um, all right, so if you're here for the first time, I think maybe we do have some first timers. We're thrilled that you're here. What we'd ask you to do is fill out the welcome card that is in your bucket there on your table. And if you take that then to the coffee counter, okay, at any time during the meetup or after meetup, uh, they'll, we have a gift for you. And it's, it's a gift card to one of four local businesses, restaurant, coffee shop in the area. Uh, we want to say thank you. We want to give you something that you can connect with someone else. And we want to support uh, those that are struggling in our community. And right now, it's some of our business owners, our entrepreneurs, our got people that have local businesses, especially the restaurants and coffee shops. So we want to see everybody flourish in our community, and that's one that way that we can help. So thank you for being here. Make sure uh, you get your gift at the coffee counter. Um, our little kids are coming April 11th, our pre-K, so two to five-year-olds. We're going to be starting that class again. We're excited for that. Many of our families with little ones, lots of little ones, uh, if you're comfortable, we'll have that. Um, as well as we, we started our outside seating today. Now, I know it's a little chilly. The sun is coming up over the building. and <laughs> if, you, uh, if, if you need you know, fresh air, you can head out there. And then we even have a little children's play area. So we're going to continue that into the spring and summer. So we're excited about that. So if you're not comfortable with your kids in class yet, that's fine. You can come sit outside and listen, engage, and meet up and still have the kids play in the ki kids area. We want to have options. And that's a new option with the weather getting better. So hopefully everybody can join us if you're comfortable doing that. Uh, MOVE is today. That's for middle and high school students. It's out at Morning Way Farm in Percival. You should have gotten the address in your uh, email, um, your move email. If you didn't get it, come ask me. I'll give you the uh, address, 4 to 6 p.m. going to be an awesome time out there for our middle and high school students. We've also got a new crew. Okay, Crew is smaller groups that just get together to build real, authentic relationships, to pray with one another, study God's word together, to care for one another and our neighbors together. We're starting a new crew that is for co uh, high school seniors, college students, and kind of early 20-somethings. Really excited about this. Um, our new intern, Harper Lee, who you'll meet at some point, is going to be uh, facilitating that and co-leading it, hopefully with, I'm throwing him under the bus, Max Goosens. Uh, we're going <laughs> to, we talked about it, we didn't land firmly on it yet, but I'm, I'm believing God's going to, so... Max and Harper Lee, great team. So if you have college students that are here, because maybe they're online and they're home, uh, high school seniors, current high school seniors, or, you know, 25 and under-ish, um, and if your students are coming back from college, just have them engage right into it when they get home. So we're trying to send emails to everybody that we have, but if we don't have your email, uh, we'll be announcing some more information about that. But we're excited about that. Easter's coming up April 4th. Be here. We're going to have outside seating. And then we surf on April 17th. It's a Saturday. You'll see it if you go outside in the outside seating or near the kids' area. This area is just, no, this area right here, this area, is just, they cut down trees and branches and just left them there. There's trash everywhere. We want to serve the Madison House, which is our, our neighbors. It's low-income elderly housing. And they walk through here all the time, and some of the uh, residents there, just they're sad because they see the trees down, and it's just a mess and whatever. And so we are going to serve them by clearing that out and, uh, and even making the, the back stairwell a little prettier. And so we're excited about that. So please, uh, you know, plan to be here Saturday, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., April 17th. Um, we could use, it. the more I went out there this week, I was like, oh, man, this is actually going to be a lot of work. So this isn't one of those like, ah, yay, we're serving. Uh, this is going to be, uh, I think, <laughs> good. We're going to sacrifice a little bit. And, and we're going to get out a chipper, you know, bring out the county or somebody to chip all this stuff up 
and it'll be awesome. So that, uh, l one last thing is we have Get Headway coming up this Wednesday. So if you're new to Headway, still have some questions, it's going to be on Zoom from 8 to 9. And I just share with you about Headway, kind of the story of Headway, our values, our mission, our vision. And so uh, if you could email info at makeheadway.org if you want to be a part of that, and we'll send you the Zoom link for this Wednesday. All right. I know that was a lot of announcements, more than we normally have, but there's just, there's just a lot going on. Um, well, I'm thrilled to uh, – oh, awesome. You guys cleared this off. For Joshua. So uh, I'm so excited and thankful to have my good friend Joshua Simonette here. Uh, I was trying to think when we met. I think, I mean, I don't know how many years ago it was, but I think I was uh, running a prison fellowship exhibit at a conference. I think maybe the Story Conference and in like Chicago. And uh, Joshua just came up to me and started talking, and, and we were, you know, we were. Uh, you know, he was from D.C., so Joshua played for the Washington football team back before it was the Washington football team, um, and uh, I was like, oh, dude, I remember you playing, you know, defensive back, and, and anyways, just hit it off there and just have continued a growing friendship um, since. Uh, he has done lots of things. He was most recently for several years serving at National Community Church as a campus pastor, heading up their leadership. He's, he's just doing lots of different things. But as you guys know, uh, the most recent thing that God has called he and his wife Erica to do is to plant both a nonprofit organization ministry that disrupt, disrupts the pipeline in Baltimore City from school to prison, the, the school to prison pipeline, where it just too many students are just going from school to being incarcerated, and uh, and so they're there disrupting that, you know, in more ways than one, and so he'll tell you a little bit about that, but then they're also planting a church, Hope Baltimore, um, and so, you know, I just love it. It's, we're, he's my brother. I love him so much. I'm so thankful just that we get to partner for the kingdom, uh, but before he comes up here, and he'll share more about what God's leading them to do, um, they, fresh off the uh, press, I guess, uh, is a, a video that talks about Hope Baltimore, the church that they are doing the work now and kind of officially launching in September. And so I'm so thankful that we get, so we're supporting them financially, okay, Blueprint and, and Hope Baltimore as it gets going, and we need to support them in prayer in more ways than one. I was thinking actually like, I don't know, see on the fifth Sunday of the month, we don't meet. I was like, we need to do a field trip out to Hope Baltimore. <laughs> um, so we'll get, we'll figure that out. Um, <laughs> so, but let's watch this video, which is just powerful. I watched it right before, and me and Joshua looked at each other like, dude, we got to show that. So we like, I grabbed Luke. I was like, can you throw this on there? So uh, Luke and Brennan made that happen. So we're going to watch this video, and then Joshua's going to come up and share with us from God's word. So let's watch this. Baltimore, more affectionately known as Baltimore. From all of its sides, there is beauty and grit. Ingrained in the people, embellished on its walls, echoing from its history. The charm is not relegated to just certain parts of the city. There's value in the vacant, emptiness in the exclusive. Both are primed for hope and glory to fill those voids. Not with the kind of hope that is cheap and shallow, but a fulfillment in the soul that unlocks the depth of your spirit. For this reason, a new faith community is formed. Not new as in better or exclusive, but a continuation to join a movement already in progress. Our mission? To connect people to Jesus and to one another. Why? because we want to share a new or a renewed hope. To the young cats trying to find their way, to the professionals setting their sails towards success, and even the old heads with long roots and perspective. 
We're creating space to grow and to be known together, striving to be one in spirit and one in mind, celebrating the uniqueness of our hues, breaking down the division in our diversity, and an openness to embrace questions of all kinds, because that's what Jesus did and is still doing. We aim for our actions in the streets to be like the acts of the scriptures, sharing things in common, breaking bread together, sacrificing for the greater good, because this honors God and reflects his glory. We want to invoke his presence in our city, and we also invite your participation in this hope. We are Hope Baltimore. So good to be with you guys. Am I on? Yeah, I think I'm on. Am I good? All right, I can grab a hand here if I need to. That's all right. I can I can take the hand here. We can we can. Yeah, we can pivot. Yeah, let's do that. Got to call audible sometimes. Let's try this again. Headway. So good to be with you guys. I don't know if that was a great idea to play that video beforehand, and it, just, it makes me a little emotional um, just thinking about those words that that I wrote and thinking about the city of Baltimore and what we hope to do there. And um, yeah, I'm just honored to be here sharing with you guys, uh, honored to be asked by Drew to come again. I, I've shared with Headway before, so it's good, good to be back. It's always great when people invite you back to their house. Um, some people you might not be as excited about inviting back, so... Um, good, good to be back. Hey, if you guys would do me a favor and meet me in the book of Esther, uh, we'll get there in just a second. Uh, but the book of Esther, uh, chapter four, uh, I got a lot of things on my heart, a lot of things I want to share today. So we'll, we'll dive right in, uh, if you don't mind. Um, in college, uh, I was an English journalism major, uh, which wouldn't surprise you if I told you that I love words. Uh, my wife tells me that I use too many words. Um, she's basically saying I, I talk a lot. Um, but specifically when it comes to words, I, I love like um, word meaning, uh, etymology, so where words come from and their history and um, their, their meaning. And then I love the color of words and its artistry and, and all of these different things. I, I also love trying to uh, use words to capture moments ideas, descriptions sometimes, and maybe a word or two. Disruption is a word that I am thinking of today because it is the word that I would use to describe my world over the last two years. Maybe for you, a year, thinking of COVID, but for me too, as I think about how we Moved our family from Northern Virginia and Alexandria, a nice community that we had known, um, kids going to school, and it's just great uh, to a place unknown like Baltimore. And uh, my uh, middle school and high school daughter, um, man, they, I guess they were thinking that their childhood is forever scarred when we told them where we were moving and what we were doing. And maybe, I don't know, word on the street, uh, was that uh, my wife and I, Erica, are in the middle of an early midlife crisis. I, I, don't, I don't know. We're launching essentially three startups at once, this nonprofit, this church, and my wife is also an entrepreneur. And we're going to a new city. There are going to be new schools. We're putting all our eggs in, in, in one basket. Like, the math just doesn't add up, right? And because the math doesn't add up, I'm careful with how I talk about these things because it's just hard for people to reconcile uh, some of these things. Now, now things are, are, are going well. Um, things are, are good. We, we, are, we, we have uh, some, some good momentum and, and things uh, are, are happening. As, as uh, Drew just mentioned, we have this, this nonprofit called Blueprint. 
where we're trying to disrupt the school to prison pipeline. And all that simply means is that um, young people are finding themselves in situations sometimes happening at school where they uh, are then put into juvenile detention, which then leads to uh, a life of in incarceration. And there's research that shows that it actually th it starts early. It actually starts in third grade. Um, so if you want more information about that, you can go to weareblueprint.com, um, and we, we break that down a little bit, and we'll, we'll start to have some more videos about, about all those uh, sorts of things. But we had to pivot because we can't be in front of students right now, so we've turned into um, um, some uh, relief work with the school partner that we're working with in West Baltimore. We provided coats and um, supplies and all sorts of things, and we have another school in Baltimore where we are painting murals in the schools. Um, to inspire the students. So we're doing a lot of different things, even though we can't be in front of students uh, right now. Um, all of this is a precursor to Hope Baltimore, which you just saw, saw the video for. Um, and we wanted to put this, this blueprint project before Hope Baltimore as a precursor to our work in the community because we wanted to begin to invest before we invite. We didn't think it was cool to go into a new city, a new place to parachute in, put a flag down and say, hey, come to church. But we wanted to actually get into the community and we wanted to uh, invest. Now, all of this makes sense on paper, right? Still confusing to some. But then you have COVID, right? And then COVID just disrupts things to the 10th power. Now, uh, I studied English at an engineering school, so math never adds up really for me. But I do know that when you put anything to the nth degree, it means exponential. And so that's essentially what COVID has done, is it's caused this exponential disruption. For many of us, it's, it's involved disrupting the normalcy of our lives, um, and innovation has become necessary for our families, um, and then even companies and corporations uh, to survive. But, but the thing that I've been paying attention to and the thing that I hope you've been paying attention to and the thing that keeps resonating for me is this disconnection of the fabric of our relational connectivity. That's what's actually been exposed. This, this divide in our country racially and socioeconomically continues to bubble. And, and it has reached a point over this last year where tensions are very, very high. And I want to just park right here today in that spot, which I know is a little bit uncomfortable for all of us, but I think it is necessary for us because it's significantly relevant. Unfortunately, it's also repetitive throughout human history. And the good thing about this is the Bible has a lot to say about this. This disruption that I'm talking about ushered in by COVID uh, has, has really elevated and illuminated for us that we have some unresolved issues relationally. And we can debate about this if you like. But I think it shows that we are anything but united in these United States. Now, I don't need to rehash um, Ahmaud Arbery and George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and the political divide between Democrats and Republicans and the, 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 the things that we saw in the Capitol and storming the Capitol. And, and then even what we've been seeing with our Asian brothers and sisters, the microaggressions all the way to what we saw in Atlanta last week. I don't... I don't need to rehash all of those things. We, we know those headlines. We, we've seen those things. And it has put us in a prolonged state, I believe, of, of disruption that we need to address. And I believe that the disruption is actually an opportunity for us. Although we don't like being disrupted, we don't like when God sometimes kicks the door in or he messes up our routine but oftentimes, he's up to something, and he's inviting us in to what he is up to. And I believe that the potential opportunity for the people of the way, which is what they call the Jesus followers, the people of the way, that's the church. I believe the opportunity for us is this. 
embrace the discomfort. Embrace the discomfort. I know that's not a sexy title for a message, which yeah, that's the title I want to use for today. And don't worry, I'm only here for one week and then I'm leaving uh, on this Sunday. But, but embrace the discomfort. See, disruption causes discomfort. And it's clear in the scriptures to me that discomfort is a prerequisite to being on mission with God. It's clear to me. Let's just look at Joseph. Let's look at uh, Abraham and Noah and Moses and Joshua and Caleb and David. All of them experienced some level of disruption in their lives that caused discomfort, but these are the people that we talk about, that we celebrate, and that we look to for inspiration because they embraced the discomfort and God worked in their lives miraculously. Now, I don't need to explain embracing the discomfort on a personal level to us, right? Because we kind of know what that's like. We've experienced that over the last year. And then we also know it in other ways where, hey, we're trying to work out, you know, and, and eat a little bit healthier and get our bodies in shape. But maybe we don't love going to the gym and that stuff hurts. But we embrace it. Maybe not as consistently as we should, but we but but there's a season when we embrace it because we understand that it's going to produce something. I don't need to tell um, our sisters in the room who have had children that you have a baby you carry for nine months and then you push it out in labor. Like that's discomfort. <laughs> I mean, that probably need, not even a stronger word. I need a stronger word for that. But but you understand what it means to embrace. That's that discomfort. Or maybe you're pursuing a goal and you need to save money or you need to sacrifice in a particular area. We, we understand what that means. But here's the thing. We're cool with that when it's on our terms. When we're choosing it, we're not cool with it when it chooses us, when it knocks on our door unexpectedly. This brings me to one example in Scripture that I want to highlight for us in the book of Esther this weekend and Esther is, she's a young Jewish woman. The scriptures tell us that she's beautiful. She, she is, she's gorgeous to look at. And she is raised by her cousin, Mordecai, because her parents were killed. And she is now an orphan. All right? Now, during this time, when this story is written, Esther is in exile with her cousin's family, Mordecai. Mordecai was taken off into exile under the leadership of, uh, or rulership, I should say, of King Nebuchadnezzar into Babylon. And literally what that meant was when the conquering king came in and he would take the people into their, away from their land, strip their land, and those people were forced to live under a foreign ruler and to adopt their customs and to worship their gods. Essentially, the god of the, of, the, of the reigning empire had defeated the god of those who were captured. And so the expectation then was for the people to bow down and worship and serve these foreign gods. So Esther is in this unusual situation as a Jew. All right. She eventually becomes queen. All right. Through some providential uh, way, she becomes king. Uh, it, it, the scripture tells us that 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 Queen Vashti uh, was rejected. It, she uh, refused to come out to 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 greet the, the king. And he got upset and said, hey, you know what? I need a new queen. And that's a whole separate. I, I should probably preach on that because it's women's history month. But I'm going to just keep uh, I'm going to just keep moving. But, but, but here's what happened. The, the Jewish people are not really loved. They're despised. They're hated people while they are in exile. And so Mordecai, who has some sort of, this is, this is Esther's cousin, and I'm leading up to the passage that we're going to read in just a second. Mordecai has some sort of position within this foreign kingdom. And there's another guy named Haman who's been promoted as the, 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 he has the highest position of all of the officials in the land. And so Mordecai's 
Mordecai should bow down to him when he comes into the room or when he walks by. But Mordecai refuses. And the, the king's officials are saying to Mordecai, yo, what's up, man? Like, why, why are you refusing to bow down? And Mordecai just continues to not bow, and it upsets Haman. So Haman says, listen, I'm not cool with that. And not only am I not going to, and not only am I going to deal with you, I'm going to deal with all of your people. And I'm going to put an edict out for all of you to be erased, to be killed. And he gets the king to sign off on this. Mordecai hears of this. It says he fasts, he prays, he goes into mourning with all the Jews. And then he sends word to Esther, who's now the queen. He sends word to Esther about the plot and asks her to plead to the king and Esther is in a position now of privilege. Esther is now in a position of protection. Esther is now, she's made it. She's moved on up like the Jeffersons. And this is what she says to Mordecai. She says, Mordecai, I love you, cousin. But I cannot. It's against the law for me to go in and see the king if he doesn't ask me to come. So if he doesn't ask me to come, then I can't come. And if I do, I can be killed. I can lose my life. So let's pick it up in verse number 12 in Esther 4. It says, Esther's response was reported to Mordecai. Mordecai told the messenger to reply to, reply to Esther, don't think you will escape the fate of all the Jews because you are in the king's palace. If you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will come to the Jewish people from another place. But you and your father's family will be destroyed. Who knows? Perhaps you have, been, you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. So then Esther responds to Mordecai. She says, Go and assemble all the Jews who can be found in Susa and fast for me. Don't eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and any female servants will also fast in the same way after that. I will go to the king even if it is against the law. If I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went and did everything Esther had commanded. There's really only one point that I want to make in this message. So this, just, this should make it easy for you. One, one point. And it's summarized in, in one word. And that one word is sacrifice. Because in order to embrace the discomfort, you have to sacrifice. You're signing up for sacrifice. And in this ancient story, we see the role of sacrifice or, 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 or how sacrifice plays itself out. And I just want to point out um, just, just three different ways that, that we see this, all right? First of all, we see sacrifice with Mordecai, right? So Mordecai, he refuses to bow down to Haman, okay? And you have to understand the significance of this. Now, the Jews are not, they're, they're, they're hated people. And so Mordecai is putting himself in a position where he can lose his livelihood at, at a minimum, and then at most, he can lose his life. But he refuses to bow down when it just it seems like an easy compromise for him to just bow down so that he can protect himself, so that he can keep, you know, uh, supporting his family and all of those sorts of things. It seems like a small thing, right? But when you understand that the Jews were given the law or the Ten Commandments by Moses, and in that it said you should not bow down to any other God. You shouldn't have any other God before you. In other words, God is saying you give your allegiance to me alone. And so Mordecai refuses to bow down. And then when he hears about this plot, because he didn't just bow down. Now, he didn't bring something upon himself. He brought it upon his, all of his people. What does he do? He doesn't run and say, I'm sorry. He doesn't say, okay, I'll bow down. He doesn't, he doesn't say, just, just, just take me out and don't worry about it. No, it says he then responded by tearing his clothes 
fasting and praying and weeping before God. This is also a form of sacrifice. And I believe that what Mordecai has done and what he is continuing to do is model for his cousin Esther how this thing is supposed to go. And he becomes a prophetic voice for Esther to show her, hey, this is how we respond as a people. This is what we do. And can I tell you that if you consider yourself to be part of the church, if you are a part of those who follow the way, you follow Jesus, we are called to be a prophetic voice. That's what we're called to. Not by what we say, but how we live. How we respond to the things that are happening around us. We're called to be a prophetic voice. What does that mean? What are we being prophetic about? We're being prophetic about God's kingdom, God's economy, and how things work in his kingdom. But our opportunity is lost. When we prioritize comfort or we prioritize protecting our assets or protecting ourselves. But can I tell you that those assets and that protection that we have, God gave it to us. It was God that provided it for us. He he opened those doors for us. But when we compromise and we bow down to protect ourselves, we lose our prophetic voice and I can see how COVID has exposed some of these things. I can see how COVID has shown us how we bow down and how we prioritize our comfort, how we prioritize our individualism. And I can see how it has rendered some of us who are part of the church as being an ineffective prophetic witness. Because in essence, sometimes the disruptions that cause discomfort cause us or push us or influence us to bow down in ways we should not, to accept things that we should not, to go along with things that we should not because we don't want to cause too much fuss. We don't want to be a disruption. But listen, when I read the story of Jesus, when he came on the scene, everywhere he went, he was disrupting stuff. Not because he wanted to disrupt, but because he wanted to bring justice. He wanted to bring bring reconciliation. He wanted to bring righteousness. And that's what we're called to do. So we see this in Mordecai. We also see this sacrifice in the Jewish people, right? Now, there was a communal response. Once they heard about this plot, there was a communal response to this, all right? And the communal response was, hey, we are all going to fast and pray. Even before Esther asked them to do it, they were already responding in that way. Now, listen, when when I talk about a communal response, that's very difficult for us in this Western context because we pride ourselves on our private lives and our individualism. So other people's things that's happening in their house, that's their problem. I'll help you at a distance, maybe. But but we don't tend to respond communally because that's that's not built into the fabric of this country. So we struggle with that. But you know who should be good at that? The church. You know who should be modeling that? It should be the church. We should be the prophetic example to the world of this is how you do it. But we, but we struggle because we idolize individualism. You know, we champion uh, the Bill of Rights, which I think is great. I don't have any issue with that. But, but we champion it so much so that it, it often causes more division between us than we think. And, I, and oftentimes at the expense of others. And as the church at the expense of the mission that we've been called to. The church should see issues and run to them, not away from them. The church should be on the lookout for breakdowns in the community, 
to see how we can address them. You know, um, I, you guys know that I'm, um, we're planting this church in Baltimore, and I had someone um, reach out to me and send me an email and, and want to wanna have a, a conversation there on our launch team, wonderful woman. Um, she's, you know, businesswoman and, and a really good, she's become a good friend. And she wanted to ask me about this specific kind of area and what vision did I have for addressing this. And, and I said, well, I don't mean to be disrespectful, but we don't need a vision for that. Because the vision that God has given us is to show up in our community and love. And if we see problems, we should address that. So you know what you know what you can do? Actually, if that's on your heart and God is, is stirring you about that, get a group of people who care about that same thing, go address it, and then send me an email and tell me what you did. Because that, that, that's, that's how we are, that's how we should, wire, we, we, we should be wired as the church. I was also thinking about this one example to just kind of help you guys see how we've drifted from our mission. Do you know that um, the word yacht in its original uh, language, it, it, it comes from a Dutch word that means hunt. And so literally what um, the, the Dutch um, Navy did was created these, these yachts, these smaller, faster, faster, nimble vessels that were built to chase down and hunt pirates, to get them away from their ships, to get them away from their, from their trade industry, and to run them out and basically defend them uh, and, and basically take care of them. But when we think about yacht and now yacht clubs, it, I mean, it's turned into the, the exclusive of the exclusive. It's a hangout spot. And listen, I don't have any issue with that. Like, if that's your thing, do your thing. But, but my point that I'm trying to make is that that's a drift or that's different from the original intention. And the church shouldn't turn into yacht clubs. The church shouldn't turn into exclusive meetups where we care more about what we do here than how we live in our neighborhoods. We care more about what songs we sing and, and, and what vision do we have for X as opposed to responding in ways that we should respond. I'm going to get off of this point and keep going. Embracing discomfort for us is about condition inconvenience. I wish it was different, but that's what it's about. And if you're familiar with the, the story of the Good Samaritan in Luke 10, it's all about this idea of embracing discomfort. Because there were two people who came along the way before the Good Samaritan, but they were busy. They had other things to do. And if, if, if they got involved, it, it would throw a bunch of things off, it, including one of them being the priest. If he had touched the person, then he would have been rendered unclean, then he had to go unclean, then he had to go back, he had to go through all this. It, it, would, it just majorly inconvenienced him. So he had somewhere else to go. But it was the Good Samaritan who was actually the enemy, the person that nobody wanted to be engaged with, who actually came to the person's aid. This, the Good Samaritan allowed himself to be disrupted and put in a place of discomfort. Are you willing to do that? Let me, let me just keep, keep moving. Let's get to Esther. Esther's response is, it, it's just, it's unbelievable to me because, number one, she allows herself to be challenged by her uncle. She's now in a position of greater authority over her uncle, and she's now the queen. She can do whatever she wants to do, but she allows her uncle to challenge her. And her uncle is saying, hey, yo, listen, don't think that you're going to escape just because you're the queen. Like, you're going to have to contend with this somehow, some way. And so when she allows herself to be challenged, which means she allows herself to be inconvenienced, she then decides that she's going to lay down her privilege, her protections, her provisions, because she understands that there's a cost. It's either upfront cost or it's a back-end cost. And when I think about back-end cost, I think about interest, which is a lot more money than I want to pay. But here's the, here's the overall point that I want to make for you. This is, this is what I'm driving at right here. Esther doesn't say, okay, I'm going to see what I can do and, and try to talk to the king. There's plenty of ways she could play her card. She didn't say, ooh, yeah, like, I'm just going to pray about it. 
what Esther did was she actually took on the burden herself. As the queen, knowing that it would cost her, she said, tell the people to fast for three days. I'm going to tell my servants to fast for three days. I'm going to fast for three days because I know what I'm going to do. I'm not fasting because I want God to show me what to do. No, I'm going to do this. I'm going to carry this burden for my people. And if I perish, I perish. Can I tell you that Paul talks about this in Galatians 6 too. He says that we should carry one another's burdens. In this way, you fulfill the law of Christ. Do you know that Greek word is anecho? And it literally means to enter into the suffering. Now, that's the last thing that we want to Listen, I'll give a donation. I'll call my friend. I'll see what I, but I, listen, I don't know if I can show up or I can do that. That's a little bit too much for me. But literally, this is what Paul says that we are designed to do. This is our mission. To carry one, I'm going to enter into the suffering. Esther has every opportunity to avoid the suffering, but decides to enter into it, sacrificing everything, potentially. We advertise in our culture and in our country, we advertise and promote individualism and only champion and sing about unity in hard times. When it gets hard, oh, then we want to be united. Then we want to come together. But that's not how we live. That's not the messaging that we subscribe to. We have to be people of sacrifice, meaning to be fiercely loyal to God and each other. Can I, can I just say that one more time? Fiercely loyal to God and each other. Do you know what fierce means? That those are fighting words. Like, you got to fight for this. And sometimes the fight is you. Like, I got to fight myself because I really don't want to respond this way. I really don't want to do this. But fiercely loyal to God and one another. Embracing the discomfort really equals sacrificing for something that is greater. Let me, let me close out with this. I, I just read a story literally yesterday as I was, right before I, I just kind of finalized my notes, I read this story uh, about a, uh, a man, he's 41 years old, Minneapolis, uh, Minnesota, and uh, he uh, had an apartment, or has an apartment, and he had fallen behind in his, in his rent. And he had gotten $5,000 behind in his rent. And it all had to do with COVID. He, he, he ended up getting sick. He ended up getting COVID, had to be hospitalized. Um, he was a school uh, custodian, and, and so um, he ended up, you know, kind of losing work time, which means he wasn't going to get paid, so he's out of work, and then he ended up getting some benefits, um, but the benefits had to go to his children. He's divorced, so he had to pay child support to, to his teenager. I mean, just kind of all sorts of things going on. His landlord decides that she's not going to try to force him out, even though legally, like, you can't do that right now, but she decides she's not going to try to force him out. She, she didn't press him, give him a hard time. She, she didn't just kind of sit back and say, there's nothing I can do. You know what she decided to do? She decided to enter into his suffering. That's what she decided to do. And let, let me tell you how she did. She eventually remembered that she had talked to some of his, 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 his references. She called them, told them about the situation. They couldn't really help her um, and help him financially, but what it did, though, was it gave her perspective and it gave her empathy. That's what happens when we enter into the suffering. It gives us perspective and empathy and understanding. And so then that fueled in her like, well, you know what? I've got to find a way to help this man. And then as she's trying to help him, stuff happens in her life. She's divorced. She's trying to, you know, pay her bills, and she ended up being hospitalized for something as well. And so all of these things are happening. But she still continues to fight for this man. And so eventually she remembers, I have a network of, of, of family. I have a network of friends. Maybe I can raise money to help this man so that he can eventually help himself at some point. She raises so much money that she, she is able to, to pay the, the, the back rent and then get his rent paid through June. And she renewed the lease for another year. 
enter into his suffering. Sometimes we're just too concerned about checking the right boxes. Sometimes, you know, we're just concerned about things that don't make sense. We all got, like, some of these little things that don't make sense. Like, mine is like, I don't like my food to touch, you know, like. I, I, you know, I just kind of got this thing, you know. I know it's a little weird, but some of, some of us got these things, you know. We just don't like certain things that, you know, touch us, you know. <laughs> but to be a Jesus follower, to be people of the way, we enter into the suffering. I just want to pray for us as we, as we close today. Go ahead and read the end of Esther's story in your conclusion. It, it, it turned out good. It worked out, it worked out well. Esther was able to advocate for her people. And, and, and guess what? Haman, who kind of set up this plot, he got dealt with. Now, listen, I want to be real. Sometimes it doesn't always happen that way. Sometimes it isn't like you know, a happy ending. Sometimes it is. Sometimes God doesn't show up like we want him to. And he doesn't deal with stuff like we want him to. That's just reality. And we have to stop, like, selling people these make-believe fairy tales in church world because that's, that's not how it goes down. But in the end, Jesus said, listen, in this life you will have trouble, but take heart because I have overcome the world. So two quick things. If you are a Jesus follower, this, this is part of the description right here. We enter into suffering. That, that's what we do. Now, hey, maybe in Leesburg or, you know, Loudoun County, may, maybe the suffering you, in, you enter into doesn't look the same in Baltimore, where there's, there's homelessness and there's joblessness and there's, there's two out of every three kids that, that lives in a single-parent home and, and there's, there's high murder rates and all. Maybe it doesn't look that way, but, but there is suffering here. Your neighbors, the people you work with, the people you shop with, are we choosing to enter into the suffering? And the reason why we are in the divide that we are in in this country right now is because we have too many people who are unwilling to enter into the suffering. And guess what? I don't expect other people to. I expect the church to. We got to lead the way. Second, if you're not a Christ follower, if you're not following Jesus, I don't know how you're going to be able to enter into the suffering without him. You can't do it on your own. You, you need a supernatural power in order to do that. You just can't do it on your own. And so I want to invite you to consider stepping into this mission where Jesus says, like he said to the rich young ruler in Matthew 25, listen, I have more for you than your stuff. I have more for you than your, your career ladder that you've climbed. I have more for you than your nice home and all of these things. I have more for you than that. Because those things are going to pass away. But what I have for you is eternal. Let's pray. God, we thank you for challenging us today. We thank you that uh, this is... This is something you've called us to, but you haven't called us to do it on our own. We don't even have the, the ability to do it on our own. I thank you for Headway. I thank you for Drew and his vision and what he's, what he's trying to model here in this community. And God, I pray that you would continue to just make all of us dis, uh, just uncomfortable. I, that, that's, that's not a popular prayer. But you will be glorified in our discomfort. You will show up in it if we respond the way that you are calling us to. Help us to be people known to be burden bearers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you guys so much. All right, Joshua's going to hang up here for a moment. But, um, oh, man. Uh, you know, if you, 
I've been doing, you know, a lot of thinking, praying recently, and just we're in year seven with Headway, and and we've learned a lot. You know, we've evolved, but our mission, our values, our vision has stayed the same. We may have had some theories of the best way to accomplish that, and then when reality hits, we go, oh, yeah, that was a great idea. That doesn't really work. Um, but you've heard me say it. Often, and Joshua just said it again. I mean, this is what headway is all about. And I understand for many of us growing up in church, it, it, it wasn't about that. It was about comfort. It was about consuming. It was about this thing that is here for me. And if this thing isn't doing a great job for me anymore, I'm going to go find another thing that meets my needs. And it's just, I get it, right? Now, we do need to be healthy and whole in order to help others come into a relationship with Jesus where they can become healthy and whole. But when we stop with us being healthy and whole, and, and are just it's, it's a perspective that, honestly, I get it. Like, lots of things have fed that for a long time. And so when we start even talking about us being the church and we're here for a lost and hurting world, and you start to take actual real-life steps in that, it's going to actually feel wrong, okay? Like a lot of things that we do that are bad for us, you do it for a while and then stop doing it, it's not going to feel good. <laughs> so we have to believe that the best thing for us is when we look at Scripture and what Jesus has called us to and, and called us to be is the best for us and for others and for his kingdom. And we have to rely on that because when it starts getting uncomfortable and, and doesn't feel good, we're going to start feeling like, oh, maybe this isn't godly. And it's like, no, I, I used to believe that. Like, oh, if God called me to something, it's going to feel really good and be easy. It's like the opposite because then you have to trust God if you're going to even do it. So I'm just so thankful for Joshua and just, look, guys, I, creating a fuss, you said that, right? Like, and I think the problem is when Jesus came, he created a fuss but not with the people that we thought he would create a fuss with. It was the religious that were upset with him. Okay? Often as followers of Jesus right now, we want to create a fuss with the world, and we want the world to start acting like we do. And it's like, why would we expect that? And we're mad, and we're frustrated, and, and someone's making a decision that affects my rights, and I'm, I'm we start acting fussy. And childish, and we start creating a fuss with the wrong group of people. Like, we have to follow Jesus. And if we follow Jesus, I think, and I'll tell you, it's hard being misunderstood at times when we start creating a fuss with the people that think we should be creating a fuss with a different group of people about different things. So I just say that because, you got something to say? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> just, Go ahead. Just, just real quick, I just want to talk, yeah. just the point about yeah. it not feeling good. Yep. Romans 5. Listen, it says, we know that the affliction, this is what, what we're being called into, the discomfort. So we just trade discomfort for affliction. All right, we know that the affliction produces endurance. Endurance produces proven character, and proven character produces hope. There's a progression here. Doesn't feel good. Then we start getting some endurance. Then that produces hope. And then here's what the hope does. The hope will not disappoint us because of God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit. I was thinking of... Uh Mordecai, he was fasting and praying, led him to know what to create a fuss about and what not to, okay? I'm excited. We're starting a new series in Daniel after Easter. We're going to go through the book of Daniel. And honestly, it is like, you know, it's going to challenge us, okay? Um, and, but I'm just reminded, Mordecai then knew what to do. And so often we have this narrative of what we're called to be about. And if we were to fast and pray and look in our Bibles, some, some of these things aren't even in there. And, and, and the things that are in there, we're not doing. And we're, we're focused on things that may even be good, 
but they're not the main thing we're supposed to be focused on. And so I just want to continue to encourage us. This is hard, okay? This is why we started Headway, because I said, I, I want to follow Jesus, and I can't do it alone. I'm not meant to. It's, I want to be part of a group of people that really want to know and follow Jesus, because I, we are going to need Jesus and his spirit and each other if we're going to actually do this. And we're still figuring it out. Seven years later, we're still figuring it out. But let's fig- continue to trust God and do this together. And the temptation, okay, is there's going to be some other things. Uh, look, I've kind of talked about it a little bit. And, and this is, I think, the enemy's greatest weapon, Okay. It's not some of these things when we look on the other side and we go, oh, my gosh, that's awful. Like, that's the enemy, whatever. Is that maybe the enemy? Maybe what if it's against what God's called us to? Yes. But I think the enemy's greatest weapon is where he just takes something and, and just slightly twists it. And it seems good. And we are so about that. And we are worshiping the idol of American Christian nationalism, to be honest, is the thing that I look at and I go, Oh, my goodness, it feels so good and so right, and we, you know, and we get excited about Jesus, and we go after this thing that is not the thing that Jesus called us to. And it, and it is, the, 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 the da- most dangerous part is we only got 24 hours of day and so much energy and time that if we don't, it's just we're not obeying God. His kingdom is not expanding, and we're suffering as well. And so I just... We, I think, this is why I'm so excited about this time in, in our, our history for Headway, because as you said, we can lead by example, by loving Jesus, loving one another, and truly loving our neighbors, and even loving our enemies, people that feel like they're on the other side of something. If we did that, his kingdom would be expand and be fruitful and exponential in so many ways. Um, one la- one yep. last thing. There's one very practical way that you can take everything that we're talking about and do. And this is what I challenged our launch team to do. Think about three to five people that cross your path throughout the week regularly. Like the same people. Like for me, it will be my neighbor that lives behind me, Corey and Megan. It would be the, um, the, the mail delivery person that comes. There's actually two different ones um, that come. They kind of uh, rotate. Uh, who are those people? And how can you start to become a prophetic witness to them? That's just how you show up. Like, I mean, wouldn't it be great if, like, you know, your, your mail person or delivery person loves to come to your house because once or twice a week there's going to be drinks for them? You know, as they're delivering their mail or, so, I mean, just, just some sort of warm encounter. Because, like, it's not about this, this kind of quick thing that happens. But what about three, four, five years down the road when you have become that person of peace to them and then they start to talk to you about their marriage? Or they start to talk to you about what they're struggling with in their life? Or they start to open up doors? But it's because of what you've been doing the past three years or however long. So think, just think about those three to five people. Write their names down. Put it on the refrigerator. Put a note in your phone. Remind something. Pray for them. Ask God to just give you wisdom on how to engage with them. So I want to pray for Joshua and Erica and their their three girls and their son as they continue with Blueprint, as they continue just building relationship in the community, investing in the community as they get ready to invite people into this church family and this uh that we can, you know, we want to be, we get to, I'm thankful, we get to be a part of the kingdom in Baltimore, um, you know. So let's pray. Reach out your hand. God, we thank you so much for Joshua and Erica and their children. We thank you, God, just for I, the courage, the faithfulness to go into, uh, you know, the uncertainty, the unknown. I mean, there is nothing scarier than uncertainty, the unknown. Yet they trusted you enough to go uh, without having all the answers, God. And I thank you for that, God. I pray for all of us that we would do the same, God. And I thank you that we get to partner uh, for your kingdom with them. And and we don't even know all that that's going to look like in the future. But we count it a privilege to, uh, with our brothers and sisters, to uh, be about your business together. And we just, uh, God, we can't do it alone. We need your spirit in us. Uh, We need one another to encourage us, 
And uh, God, I'm just excited for the kingdom uh, in Baltimore City. God, I'm excited for the, the students that are going to be, uh, th- their life is going to be interrupted and disrupted, God, and they're going to come to know you and their lives will be transformed through the work of Blueprint and Hope Baltimore. And so, God, I just pray that you continue to give Joshua uh, vision, wisdom, uh, perseverance, um, courage, all that they need, God, to keep moving forward. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Awesome. Uh, One last prayer. I want to pray for uh, Amanda. Um, So I love seeing the Green family here today. Uh, If you haven't been doing, Amanda's been dealing with just in the last week some really, talk about suffering, real physical challenges. She's she's been dealing with some for a long time, and and, uh, again, an unexpected thing arose, and so we need to pray for her um, and for Ryan and for the kiddos, and then we need to come alongside them in in practical ways. Uh, We need to keep praying for them. There's a care calendar that we've got uh, of different ways that we can love on uh, the Green family. So I know it's hard. Some of her needs more than anything are during the week and some of it's work or whatever. Pray about it, okay? We all... It's, it's so easy sometimes to go, oh, well, I can't in that way. You pro- maybe you probably can't, but maybe you can. Maybe God says, hey, sacrifice this little thing so you can do this. If we all came around them, there would be more than enough love and their needs being met. So if we could reach our hands out to Amanda and Ryan and, and Lane there. Jesus, you are the healer. God, it's, I know, it's, it's easy to doubt you because things don't work out the way we expect or we want. We can doubt whether you're good. We can doubt what you're up to. God, we are, we're all, we've all been there, and, and I think we're all there to some degree. God, I'm, a, I'm thankful, though, that faith is not without doubt. Faith means in the midst of doubt, we still believe who you are and what you've done and what you can do. And so we believe God, in your healing power, and pray, God, we ask that you would heal Amanda's body. God, in the name of Jesus, your name is powerful. Your name is, uh, has authority over everything on this earth. And so we just humbly ask that. God, give answers to the doctors. Bring uh, people around them to meet their needs physically, uh, spiritually, emotionally, God. Um, that they would just find peace and comfort knowing that they're not alone, Jesus. And uh, I, I just thank you that they got to come today and, and be here, God. That's, that's miraculous in and of itself. You're working, Lord, and we thank you for that. So, God, we just uh, we believe uh, in your power. We believe in, um, you know, that you've got a purpose in this. We trust you. Even when we can't look at the circumstances and quite know what you're up to, We know you, and we know that you're up to good, and so we're going to trust that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Man, thank you so much, Joshua. Uh, So I'm excited. Guys, we'll keep, you know, we're trying to do a better job at just talking about our partners and what they're up to, and and so we'll be hearing about what's going on. Go to weareblueprint.com. Go to wearehopebaltimore.com, and you can stay up to date directly. Um, But... uh, Love you guys, and thankful for you. Thanks for coming all the way out here. Uh, We'll be here next Sunday. I think it's Palm Sunday next Sunday, right? Awesome. So hopefully good weather, and we'll have outside seating again. Uh, Love you guys. We'll see you hopefully during the week, if not Sunday. Something